So my name is Laura Eko and I work at the University of Helsinki. I'm an economic and social historian and um, I've promised to talk to you about my current research, which is about ready-to-wear industry in Sweden and Finland. And today I will talk about the rise, the short golden days and rapid decline of the industry first in Sweden and then subsequently in uh, Finland. Um, so what is ready-to-wear industry? Now, people have always worn clothes, of course, throughout the human history. Yet, uh, so historically speaking, it's for quite a recent phenomenon that we go and buy our clothes off the rack uh, from department stores or retailers as uh, standard-sized factory-made clothing. So for most time of, of history, uh, clothes were either made at home, self-made, or people would go and have a custom-made uh, outfits uh, by a tailor. Or if you were poor, you would get a second-hand cast of clothing, because clothes used to have much more uh, economic value compared to what they have today. So, um, and even shorter was the period when the clothes we are wearing, the factory-made uh, standard-sized clothing, uh, were actually made in countries like uh, Sweden and Finland. And that is the uh, research period uh, my study uh, covers. So I'm asking, uh, I'm asking when and how the ready-to-wear industry uh, and markets were introduced to the Nordic countries. And then I'm following the development of the industry uh, up to the end when the industry was cleared out and moved to uh, other countries. Um, because, so today, most of us, I guess all of us, uh, we have ready-made uh, clothes. Our clothes might be designed uh, in, in Scandinavia. Uh, so the, the, the branding, the logistics, the marketing uh, may be in Scandinavia, but most of our clothes are almost uh, for sure, they are made somewhere else. Um, so now, what used to be the factories where the clothes were making, it's rather part of the industrial his, uh, heritage. Um, and specifically, so the research period I'm talking about, it's from the late 19th century to the 1990s. And um, in my data, in my research data, there is one specific company, uh, TH Lapidus, which uh, exemplifies and illustrates many of the aspects that are really important for my study. So I'm uh, taking Lapidus with me to give you some uh, idea what my study is about. Uh, Lapidus was established in Burros in 1882, and it was working, uh, or it was in business uh, until the 1990s. And this is the old factory building in the outskirts of Burros. It's now about to be demolished uh, in quite soon. Um, why is ready-to-wear industry uh, interesting? Um, so um, you may think that you don't know anything about economic and social history, but you probably do know a little bit of textile industry, because textile industry is kind of the textbook case of industrial revolution, often already taught in high school. Um, and in textile industry, uh, so you see, for example, uh, the uh, factories of Finlays. And so it do for the uh, industrial takeoff of Finland in the early 19th century, or in the mid-19th century, textile factory of Finlays in Tampere used to be the largest industrial factory in Finland. Uh, and basically, well, many of the major economic historians, they have written about textile industry, first in, 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 uh, in the UK, in Britain, and then uh, in other places. So there is lots of research about textile industry, where as much less has been written and said about ready-to-wear industry. And um, if you compare the two pictures, you can a little bit start to understand why, because to start up with the textile industry, uh, it was the first, it was among the first industries to be mechanized, but to build up a textile factory, you need lots of capital. It's a very capital intensive industry. Uh, so to build up these huge textile factories, lots of money is required. 
Whereas, uh, in contrast, in ready-to-wear industry, basically all you need uh, is a sewing machine. So, very little is needed to start up uh, of your own. And consequently, it means that ready-to-wear industry is some business uh, which is completely based on subcontracting networks. So you often have one company uh, making clothes, contracting part of the deals to another company, which may again contract uh, part of the cheapest labor to another company. And often at the very end, you have a, a, a woman making clothes at home. So home industry is very much part of the ready-to-wear industry. And uh, often, very often, uh, this woman uh, has an immigrant background. And this is where the lapidus comes in to the picture of the story for the first time. So I'm sorry for the quality of the, the picture, but it may now be a symbol of how the, like, of the historical layers between me as a researcher and my sources. But um, so originally there was this family. The woman was uh, called uh, Taube Hanna Schwarzman. She was from a Jewish family from Lithuania, or what today uh, is part of Lithuania. And her family migrated to Sweden in the 1860s. And when she grew a bit older, she was married to this man, Bertrick Lapidus, from the same village, from the old country. And this couple, they moved from Malmö to Burros, and they started up with their own. They had the shoeing machine, they had this little retailing store, and um, little sweatshop. And as such, okay, it's a nice family story, and it may be an interesting story as such, it's definitely part of the larger Eastern European history. And you can take it as an example of the history of Sweden as an immigrant society. But it's also part of a broader picture. Because so wherever you go, you always hear the same story. It's, there's this large pattern that when people migrate, so you, uh, you can talk to people and they tell about their great grandparents or their grandparents or their parents. And they tell that when they first migrated, either from the surrounding countryside to the expanding cities, or from one country to another. That's how they started. They often started by sewing clothes. Um, the problem, from the point of view of an economic and social historian, is that uh, many of these firms remain really small, and they are very short-lived. And they remain, there are almost no sources left. So uh, they come and go, and you don't really uh, find them from the big archives or from, from the history books. And um, as such, uh, as such small companies or family businesses are almost insignificant. But then together, if you take them as a part of the larger subcontracting network and a cluster, um, they look much more important for the economic development. Um, so, where do we find data? So we, of course, as uh, we of course have all kind of industrial statistics from the 1880s. We have occasionally different business censuses. We have official reports and uh, business and industry investigations and studies. And for the larger companies, there are business archives, or they often store their material to business archives. Um, but if you look at the cover picture of, of um, of one uh, such investigation, uh, you will see it's <coughs> it's almost aspirational. So what? So you see what are the questions, or what were the questions the contemporaries had in their mind when they were investing to collecting the data and, and uh, collecting data for industrial statistics. So their idea was that modern societies and modern economies would be about growth, uh, not just economic growth, but the firm size would grow, the factories would get bigger and bigger. And this is this consequently means that they tend to omit and ignore the really, really small companies, which are difficult to categorize and distinguish. And it's even sometimes hard to say who actually is an entrepreneur, who is a self-employed tailor, and who is an employee within this uh, 
uh, subcontracting networks. So then, uh, as an economic and social historian, so we use we use our imagination and we have all kind of different sources to to find our data. And for this specific study, I've uh, part of the uh, very much of my data comes from. So I meet people and I, I they tell their story. Uh, so much of the his, uh, part, much of my data is actually based on oral history uh, and interviews. But of course, following the statistics, coming back to the industrial statistics, and uh, we can of course follow the statistics and see the basic development, how the industry de developed. Um, and this is pure data. This is based. This is just the number of workers in the Swedish ready-to-wear industry from the 1920s to the 1990s. <coughs> and the curve starts from the 1920s. And it doesn't mean that there was no ready-to-wear industry in Sweden before that at all. It only tells, well, that uh, <coughs> the industry was so small <coughs> that it was, it's not, uh, um, it's not a distinguished category of its own in the official statistics of Sweden, where this data comes from. So you can follow the curve and you see that the <coughs> number of workers were increasing throughout from the ninth, throughout the interwar period. And there was this short heyday after the Second World War in the 1950s. And during those years, in the 1950s, the Swedish ready-to-wear industry, so they could, the economy was booming, and all the clothes they produced, they could basically sell for the local domestic markets. Um, the purchasing power of, of, of the Swedish consumers was growing, and they could, the factories <coughs> and the sweatshops, they could, well, they could basically offer jobs for each and everyone who would just come in and be uh, willing to work in, in the industry. And what happens then in such a situation? Of course, the, the wages tend to go up. <clears throat> and then, but when we look at these numbers, uh, so as economic and social historians, much of our work is then to contextualize the numbers and take them uh, to a larger, broader context. And there are a lot of things that, a uh, lot of issues that were important. Uh, over uh, throughout the period, so one is um, one one is the uh, European uh, trade agreements, and you see when the, the curve suddenly starts to slope down um, in the late 1950s, that's where the um, import clothing import from countries that could produce clothes cheaper than Sweden, uh, than Sweden. Started, <clears throat> and um, but there were other things as well. So there were large cartels between the bigger companies. Then there is labor market re re regulation, uh, which made uh, home industry much uh, less of an uh, interesting alternative. And um, and there are regional politics. There were governmental money subsidizing, trying to help the industry when it when there was this crisis and the industry was going down. So there were subsidies from the government, but they also wanted to give, uh, spread the industry to remote areas in, Swe uh, in Sweden where there was more unemployment. So that's the basic story. But uh, let us go back to the short golden period in the 1950s and try to look what it looked like. So you very seldom have actually pictures from the factory level, but this is this is what it would look like. This is another company, it's Algox, but it's also from Boros, from uh, west of Sweden. And um, the picture is from the mid 1950s. And you see all these women, women uh, making clothes. And you can imagine the, the noise and how dusty it is in an industry or in a factory hall like this. Um, many of the women were immigrants and most of them came from Finland. Um, and then, as said, uh, soon, uh, in the end of the 1950s, uh, the industry got in, in, in Sweden got into uh, big troubles. 
And what happens then? So a lot of the small companies, they just disappear. Many of the family companies, they just don't uh, find anyone to, to continue with the business. And then there are mergers, larger companies merge together. And at this point, Lapidus again gives an example of, of one alternative what uh, the industry owners could do in this situation. He is the uh, grandson of Taubehana Lapidus. And at one point, he bought all the shares from the rest of the family. And it, it was during his period, the company Lapidus was really flourishing and they were very innovative, trying to new things and growing very much. But in the 1960s, he decided to sell all the shares to a Swiss company called Schappe. So now the internationalization gets in. And very soon, uh, Schwappe merged with an American company called Burlington. So from, from now on, we still have Lapidus in Buros, but it's no longer a family business. It's rather part of this really large international corporation. And at the same time, it was no longer profitable to make clothes in Sweden. So what they, would they do at this point? They would decide to relocate. And where would they relocate in the late 1960s, early 1970s? They would relocate, or they did relocate to Finland. So this is now Lapidus in Loima, in west of Finland. And for a little while, from the 1970s to the 1980s, uh, Lapidus was producing clothes, piece, uh, like ready cut clothes in Loima in a factory hall like this. Um, and now you can, uh, all these Swedish companies investing to Finland at this point, they were boosting the Finnish ready to wear industry. So you can basically think of the same kind of curve going first up, then short uh, golden period, and then rapid decline for Finland. But it just took place 20 years after Sweden. But in contrast to Sweden, where the ready-to-wear industry was mostly a domestic industry, and the industry was producing clothes for domestic markets, in Finland it was an export sector. Um, it was an export sector, and many of the clothes produced in, in Finland, they were meant for the Western markets. So you see, this is from a weekly uh, magazine, Anna. The picture is from the 90s, 1969. And you see the clothes, and uh, it's golden, <laughs> uh, or color of the Swedish flag. And it's clear these clothes were made for the Swedish markets. Um, to the extent that you actually could not even buy these clothes in Finland. So they were solely meant for export. And again, as an economic and social historian, I then tried to contextualize this to a broader context. And there are a lot of things that were at stake here. So the, the industry mainly wanted to export to the Western markets. But uh, over those years, from the 1970s to the early 1980s, uh, trade with Soviet Union was a very big part of the Finnish ready-to-wear industry. And this basically what then happened. Uh, so when Soviet Union collapsed, and there was also a very bad economic crisis in Finland in the 19, early 1990s, and basically the industry collapsed very soon. And it's um, very much was left in Finland, and mostly it went out, or it was relocated out to cheaper countries, countries first to the Baltic state, states, and then eventually to China, Bangladesh. Today, the industry is uh, being established in countries like Ethiopia. Uh, but this is this is uh, so this is the uh, beginning, or this is the basic uh, frame of of my research project. And as such, the research project is, is quite a typical example of what economic and social history is about. So we often, uh, we, we tend to have uh, very long time periods. So we cover uh, long periods of time. But we often also have very micro-level micro insights into uh, broader 
uh, processes. And um, of course, what we aim to, or what I aim to do with this research, so I aim to be able to contribute to the current debates on globalization or deindustrialization in one place means industrialization somewhere else. Um, there is also uh, great debates about the uh, impact of migration to economic development. And with this uh, in-depth study about industry owner networks uh, in the Nordic context, so I'm wishing to uh, be able to then contribute to these larger discussions with a historical perspective. So that's what my study basically is about. Thank you. Okay, thank you.